Hi and welcome back to a new video. This video could have probably been my launch video, but due to the fact that everything is kind of the same on the launch day, I usually try to do some kind of unique content. And personally, I'm also always interested in just playing around with the things and like deleting. That's why this video is coming a little bit later. All right, but that should be interesting, I think. This video is supported by our long-term partner, Hetzner. Hetzner has been offering products and infrastructure for private and business clients since 1997. With their own data centers in Germany and Finland and in-house rec design and production, Hetzner can offer swift individual solutions. Using the server auction feature, you can configure your own dedicated root server and when the moment is right, snap up your offer. There is no minimum runtime or minimum contract duration and you can rent the server immediately. Unlimited traffic and gigabit connection are also included. Hetzner also focuses on ecological use of their hardware and reuses hardware as often as possible. Find out more in the link below. About two weeks before launch, I asked you if anyone found out why the 11900K is called i9 and not i7, even though I enjoyed the replies like when the Katzenfutter kicks in, which is pretty much like when the cat food kicks in, or that I shouldn't drink too much Coke Zero before going to bed. This was still a serious question. All right, let's take a look at this table, which is showing in the Intel core generations up to today. And the first one was called Intel Nehalem. Back then, they offered the dual and also quad core CPUs and depending on configuration with and without hyper threading. I'm leaving out the Intel Pentium and Celeron CPUs simply because I think most of them should be irrelevant and it just would be too much information inside this chart. It's easy to see that after the first core generation, Intel differentiated very much between the i3, i5 and i7 either with the amount of cores or by enabling or disabling hyper-threading. Up to the seventh generation with two cores and HT on the i3, four cores without HT on the i5 and four cores with HT on the i7. This pretty much worked until the eighth generation when AMD was very successful with the Ryzen CPUs, which also led to the fact that Intel felt some pressure and something had to move. With the ninth generation, Intel probably felt the need to have an i9 due to the fact that there was the Ryzen 9 and this is kind of like a childish behavior, but that's not only from Intel side, but also like AMD with like copying chipset names. It's just unnecessary stuff and it's getting more and more complicated for people to follow on the naming schemes and it's absolutely unnecessary. Over all those years, there was a big difference between i3, i5 and i7. Well then with the i9 until the eighth generation. And now we're taking a look at the product overview of the 11th generation from Intel. And as you all know, there is pretty much no difference between the i7 11700K and the i9 11900K, at least on a physical level. Only that the 11700K is artificially somehow crippled versus the 11900K, talking about clocks and boost function. And obviously due to the binning, the 11700K will reach lower clocks in overclocking than the 11900K. To me personally, the i9 11900K simply does not deserve to be an i9 because there is pretty much no difference to the i7 and also keeping in mind that the generation before was featuring two more cores. I think it would have been more suitable to rename the 11700K to 11650K and then renaming the 11900K to 11700K. And in addition, the 11900K should be at a lower price. If it would be at a similar level than what we are seeing right now on the 11700K, I could probably recommend the CPU, even neglecting the very high power draw. Now we're taking a look at a price overview of some of the recent CPUs, well, kind of important CPUs to me. Those prices were taken in Germany on the 6th of April. Obviously they changing day to day, but yeah. The green marked CPUs are CPUs I can absolutely recommend, but it always depends what you want to do with your CPU. The yellow marked CPUs I can still recommend, but it will depend on your use case if it makes sense to get one of these or if you can stick with one of the green marked CPUs. In the center, you can see the 10850K 10 core CPU. And right now with a quite low price of 380 euro here in Germany, this is a very interesting CPU compared to the 11. 900K, especially keeping in mind that this thing has 10 cores. Now looking at those benchmarks, starting with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which is led by the quite expensive 5950X, followed by the 11900K. What I find personally quite interesting is that the 10850K with OC is on a very similar level to the 10900K, and that's pretty much also on the same level than the 11900. In Red Dead Redemption 2 in 1080p, the 10850K with OC is even faster than the 11900K. Obviously just looking at two games doesn't tell us too much and I also completely neglected render application. But I personally think that having the two additional cores in render application would probably give you even more benefit over the 11900K. One thing Intel is still very good at, well at least 
kinda compared to AMD is overclocking and having special overclocking features. It's quite funny that Intel is introducing and working on very special overclocking features that kind of only help us extreme overclockers, but for the normal people out there like gamers, they're not very useful. But I kind of very appreciate that Intel is putting time and effort into developing some of those very, very special extreme overclocking features. That's something I'm missing on AMD. AMD doesn't really put any focus on that. Starting off with memory OC support for H570 and B560 chipsets. But at the same time, this is not really something positive. It's just good that they stopped artificially limiting those chipsets. With the 11900K, Intel also introduced a new memory controller. Looking back at, for example, 8700K to 9900K, there was always some like improvement development step over the IMC. But with the 11900K, there is an entirely new IMC, which features something which is called Gear 1 and Gear 2. In Gear 1, the memory controller will run linked to your memory. For example, that works up to 3600 MHz memory speed. Above that, well, that's also kind of like unofficial, official is until 3200 MHz. But starting from like 3600, you will have to use Gear 2, which is like the unlinked mode. And in result, the IMC will stay at a clock of 1600 MHz, while you can still increase your memory clock. But it also introduces additional latency, very similar to what we're seeing on the AMD IMCs. I performed a quick test in PUBG with 1080p in eSports setting, paired with a 3090 on the Maximus 13 Apex. 3600 is the highest I could run in GR1 ratio, which is leading to very good performance. At the same time, if we're changing this to gear 2, the performance falls behind 3200C12 in gear 1. That's why I would always recommend if you're enabling XMP, pay attention to your gear mode. Even though Gear 2 introduces higher latency, you can see on top we have the Crucial Ballistics Max Kit with 4400C19 in Gear 2. And even though the latency is higher, this is still leading our chart. Additional features such as disabling AVX completely or using the AVX offsets are very useful features, but at the same time I don't really see why you would even have AVX 512 on the 11900K. Real-time frequency allows to change your memory settings on the fly over Intel XU while your system is up and running. And that is a very cool feature for us overclockers. And also additional features such as disabling HT per core can be a useful feature for some benchmarks, for example, 3 d Mark 6, but it is a very specific thing just for extreme overclockers. Probably not very useful for gamers, but I'm very happy that Intel is still putting some focus on developing very special features for extreme overclocking. Objectively looking at the 11900K, it's a very good CPU. It's a very fast CPU for gaming and it also has a very high power consumption. So it's actually quite a good CPU, but only if it would be the only CPU that exists on the market. Now looking at everything else that exists from like AMD and also the own Intel products, I don't see why you would buy this CPU. If you would ask me personally, if like if I would personally buy a gaming PC right now and I would look at the budget, I would get the 10850K any day over the 11900K. It pretty much has the same performance in gaming while it still has more cores and it's a lot cheaper. That's why I don't understand why the 11900K exists the way it exists and it also does not deserve to have the naming i9. It should be an i7. And as much that Intel pointed out that the iGPU got so much stronger, I mean, who cares? Do we care about the iGPU? The iGPU feels like it's taking up a third of the die size, but not even a third of us is using the iGPU, so how does this make sense for us? I would personally like to see that they're getting rid of the internal GPU pretty much the same way AMD is doing it and use the space for more cores. If the 11900K had like 10 or 12 cores, it would be so much better. By the way it is right now, no. All right, that could have probably been my delayed launch video regarding the 11900K, but those are, th are some thoughts I just wanted to give you. You can leave some feedback down below if you agree or absolutely disagree. Fine with both. Thanks for tuning in. See you soon. Bye-bye.